So we already did the two power diagrams, the vacuum system and the electrical system. So the attitude indicator. I like this one because it's a good way to see that there's two gimbals. You can see the pink gimbal and the brown gimbal. So this, so you, the attitude indicator case, the part that's bro bolted to the airplane, it can rotate in pitch and it can rotate in roll and it allow those two gimbals allow that gyro to stay rigid in space. So really what you're doing is you're looking at the front of the attitude indicator and that, that shield behind it, that actually stays rigid in space or you could say stays in the same relationship to the surface of the earth and we're just changing the pitch of the airplane nose up and nose down to look at that curved plate or when we bank, we bank and the case of the instrument banks, but that gyro still stays in one place. So I like this picture better than the next one. Although technically the next one, you could argue there's two gimbals in there, but I like the other picture better, but hey, that's me. So uh, you gotta have a gyro and there's two gimbals. Those two gimbals allow it to, rot the, it, it to give us data for pitch and data for roll. Yay. And of course, I already said this last part here. The aircraft, the aircraft and the case of the attitude indicator is actually rotating around that face hooked up to the gyro. In, I know that this is hard to get your, your brain wrapped around it, but the gyro is actually not moving. It's spinning. It's trying not to move, at least. It's sitting there spinning, and you're changing your pitch and looking at that shield, that plate in there, either looking down on it or looking up at it or looking sideways at cockeyed when you'd go into a bank one way or the other. Does anybody have any questions about that? So we're still on the attitude indicator. So how does an attitude indicator work? Well, it works on the theory of rigidity in space. The theory of rigidity in space is where the gyro spins and it doesn't move. It's, it's easier to think of the gyro working as if it's on a flat earth. So if you're a flat earther, this probably helps you a lot. And when I say flat earther, you're someone who believes that the earth is flat and not a globe. Nah, it's just a round disc because those pictures from the moon, the earth is like this, but it's flat. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm trying to figure out if you have a picture of the North of the Americas, where did Africa go? I haven't sorted that part out yet. My Google feed there says a person who believes that the earth is flat is getting, got, getting permission to launch a rocket from the middle of the United States somewhere. I guess to take a picture, but I don't know. So rigidity in space, the gyro doesn't move, and you're just moving around the gyro. And, of course, we already covered on a previous slide, if you want this gyro to work, you got to have two things. It needs to be kind of heavily weighted, and it needs to, what? Spin. Spin fast, in fact. That's the problem with gyros, is if we run out of vacuum or electrical power, and they start slowing down, or we get bearing friction on it, then we might start having trouble. And, of course, we already covered the fact that there's two gimbals, so that was redundant, that there's two gimbals allows uh, pitch and roll. I'll have to fix that someday. Ah, the pendulous veins. This would be a good Edgar Allan Poe movie, book. He probably didn't write The Pendulous Veins. Is anybody familiar with Edgar Allan Poe? He wrote short stories, and they were kind of horrific. Did you read the one about where somebody gets tied up next to a wall and somebody bricks them in, and so they're stuck inside of a, a brick wall, inside of a wall? Of course, they probably suffocate, you know, in a, in a day or two. Nobody? No? Okay. All right. It's, it's like, this is like old school 1700s or 1800s horror movies, except it's all in a book, so you can imagine how terrible it's going to be. So let's see if I can get this to work. 
Yay. So here is a, and, and remember, we're talking about the attitude indicator right here. So here is a gyro, and at the bottom of the gyro, there is a weight. So if you're going to draw this, I would probably draw this around and say, and say here's the gyro. And I draw a circle. And coming down off the gyro is weights and these veins. And there's four veins on them. And it's easier to see over here, they're on a hinge point. So if they're hinged and it flops over, then correction. This is pointing straight down to the center of the, the ground. Straight down to the center of the ground. So there's a weight there. So if you're flying straight and level, which direction does the weight tend to go? Straight down. Okay. So if you're going straight down, none of these little veins open up. If you do, if for some reason anything takes this gyro and makes it tilt one way or the other, then this weight down at the bottom, it's going to get, if it gets moved left or right or forward aft, then one of those pendulous veins is going to open up. And that's one of the places where this air that's getting pulled through the gyro is going, and it's going to blow air out there. Remember, we got it. We're going to suck air in to the into this thing, but we're going to pull air out, right? Remember, the vacuum pump is pulling air out of it towards the vacuum pump, so it's pulling air out. If one of those pendulous pendulous veins open, and it's going to push on this shaft or this weight at the bottom of the gyro. So it's going to tend to push the gyro in one direction. But the tricky part is, which is really hard to remember for me, is that on a gyro, if you push on it, it acts on the gyro 90 degrees later in the direction of the rotation of the gyro. So if I'm looking down on top of this gyro, and it, I look down on it, and I see that it's spinning clockwise on the top here, if that pendulous vein opens up and it tries to push the bottom that direction, it's really going to be act on it like this and make that gyro operate in a 90 degree angle. So they got to take those pendulous veins and stick them 90 degrees ahead of where they want it to happen. The reason I'm bringing this up is if you're, if you, let's say you go out and you do a bunch of maneuvers, you do a bunch of stalls and stuff like that. This gyro is going to get wiggled around a lot. Okay. If you go back to straight and level, and it's off a little bit, those pendulous veins will bring the bottom of that weight of that gyro in the attitude indicator back to pointing straight down on the ground. Yay! This is called self-erecting. This also works when you turn the attitude indicator on, which in our small airplanes, how do you turn an attitude indicator on? You're saying, well, I turn the attitude indicator switch on, right? You flip the attitude indicator switch from the OFF position to the ON is there, where's the switch in a, in a Warrior 2? Uh, Alejandro, you flew in the Warrior 2. So where's the attitude indicator switch? When you turn on the engine, because when you turn on the engine, it spins the vacuum pump, and the vacuum pump starts sucking air through the gyro. Okay, through, the, through which two gyros? The attitude indicator and the directional gyro. Okay. So when it gets turned on because you've got the engine running, how, what's the vacuum like when the engine's at 800 to 1,000? Is the suction up there at 4.9 to 5.1? No. But is there some suction? Yeah. And do you have to get past 1,000 probably to get that thing to taxi? Yeah. So by the time you start moving, the gyro is spinning. But here's what's important. The weight at the bottom of the gyro is being pulled straight down because the airplane is relatively straight and level while it's on the ground. It's not perfect. It's not spinning up to a good enough speed to do a good job yet, but it is self-erecting. So when this thing shut down the, on the last flight and it slowed down, if that gyro tilted a little bit when it went to, came to zero RPM, as soon as it starts spinning up, the pendulous veins are going to open and it's going to self-erect that attitude indicator. So the pendulous veins are going to start working every time you get the engine started and the suction starts going. Now, you need about five minutes to get a vacuum across these gyros and about five minutes of electricity on the, on the turn coordinator to get them to start working reasonably well. But at our airport that we fly out of, or KFAT, that engine's running more than five minutes before you take off, is it not? 
It's almost impossible to get off the ground in less than five minutes. And what are we doing during the engine run to the vacuum applied to our attitude indicator on our directional gyro? During the engine run, are we getting good 4.9 to 5.1 inches of vacuum? Yeah, we are. Okay. But while we're taxiing, we've probably had a couple of minutes of low suction on them, right? And we've had a couple of minutes of really good electricity on the turn coordinator. So we're still going to be watching the attitude indicator, the directional gyro, and the turn coordinator while we taxi under the knowledge that probably the attitude indicator and the directional gyro aren't going to be that good yet. So probably what I'm going to do is not that I'm not going to be looking, but I'm going to be thinking about how do I look at that attitude indicator and that directional gyro after I've been taxiing for a couple of minutes, as in that last turn while I'm setting up to put the airplane in a position to do my engine run. And or maybe I do my engine run in a position so that I've got some space ahead of me so that now that I've got the gyros up to speed, I can do a couple of little turns and move the airplane about 10 or 20 feet and I can see if the DG and the attitude indicator are working because now they have both had a chance to get up to speed. So the pendulous veins erect the gyro when you get the vacuum running and the pendulous veins are also there to, er and when I say erect, I mean line it up so the axis of that spinning weight points straight down to the ground. And then the other time the pendulous veins are going to operate is whenever this gets out of, of kilter. It, if ever it gets off a little bit, the pendulous veins are going to bring them back to straight down. This works out great except for the fact that we, we're not going to fly the airplane straight and level all the time. This is a weight. So as soon as, I think I got it here, so as soon as they're self-directing, as soon as I go into a turn, it's not just gravity pulling that weight down, it's also centrifugal force is pulling it sideways. So in a turn, is this going to point straight down towards the ground anymore? Somebody say no. no yes. nah. So in a turn, that weight at the bottom of the attitude indicator gyro is going to get pushed out towards outward during that turn because of CF here. CF stands for centrifugal force. So now it's going to try to start, just start, the pendulous veins are going to move, and it's going to try to start erecting itself based on the fact that it thinks straight down is actually straight down and off by 10 or 15 degrees. So it's going to try to erect the gyro into the wrong location. Yeah, when, you're in, when you enter a turn, the bottom weight on the bottom of that gyro, before you start the turn, it's pointed straight towards the ground, straight level flight. As soon as you go into a turn, gravity's pulling it, but so does centrifugal force. So it's going to pull the bottom of that weight, it's going to pull the bottom of the try to pull the bottom of the gyro off. The pendulous veins are going to think that's normal and it's going to try to erect it to this position that's off. The longer the turn, the worse it is. A 180 degree turn is when you would notice this the most, but if you did a 360 degree turn, the effect would cancel it out because it's getting flung that way, but in this part of the turn, it's getting flung that way. So that the pendulous vein effort, try to erect it, if you did a 360 degree turn, would effectively cancel it out. I didn't put that in there, so... So this is where you have the worst. This is where you have the worst error. If everything's working correctly, the worst error is going to be after a 180 degree turn. And it's going to show that you are in a very slight climb and turning in the opposite direction. The really, really good news here is that it's minuscule. And you hardly ever make a 180 degree turn where it's that big of a deal. And, oh, wait, what are we doing? We go into a scan. So it's literally only going to change the, 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 the bank by a couple of degrees and the pitch by a degree or two. 
And what are you going to do? If that, if you set the pitch you think you need and you look at the altimeter and it's going down a little bit and you look at VSI and it shows a 200 foot per minute descent, what do you do? You just pull the pitch up. So you're a good scan, you're never even going to notice this. With a good scan, you're never going to notice this. I got about 60 or 70 hours of view limiting device time. And I flew some pretty old, lousy airplanes with lousy gyros, and I could never notice this of an issue. And about the only time you're ever going to do a 180-degree turn is when you're in a holding pattern. Then you fly for a minute, and then you do another holding, another 180-degree turn. So I'm just going to add there, just in case. It's worse. This, this error is worse the, at its worst at a 180-degree turn. But if you continue to make a 360 degree turn, it cancels itself out. Then, of course, acceleration, deceleration hours. Ah, wait, I think we had an FAA question. If you're accelerating, it's going to show a very, very slight higher pitch than reality. And if you decelerate, it's going to show a slower pitch than reality. We are in an airplane <laughs> flying a, a PA-28 where after we're off the ground, you know, and we're doing an 80 knot climb for cooling, and we level off and we go to 100, 110. We're, you know, all it's going to do is make us change our pitch a little, and we're going to have a good scan, and we're going to adjust our pitch by a degree or two. We're never going to notice this. And the faster you accelerate, the more you would notice it. But oh wait, we're in a we're in a warrior two. It doesn't accelerate that fast. But someday you're going to fly that Pilatus PC-12, and it's just going to knock you back in your seat, so you're going to go, woohoo! Does anybody not know what a Pilatus PC-12 is? Everybody knows? Okay, all right. Does anybody have any questions about this slide? All right, of course, if you yank and crank, if you have huge changes in pitch, or not huge changes, but huge amounts of pitch, like you're going to plus 40 degrees of pitch, minus 40 degrees of pitch, you're going past 60 degrees of bank, then you can get this thing to tumble. Because those gimbals in there, they go so far, and then they hit the inside of the case. The only time you're ever going to have this issue is if you are completely out of control and you have, you know, the airplane's like this. So you will not, even when you're practicing unusual attitudes in the airplane, you are not going to get to the point where you've hit the stop of those gimbals on the inside and you're going to cause it to tumble. You're not going to get that far, even when your instructor is making you practice. Literally, they're going to say, look down, and they're going to, they're going to say, I have, the, I have the controls, and they're going to change a pitch and put it into some kind of a bank, and then you get a look up, and then you get a fix it. We're still not going to go past 30 degrees of pitch, and we're not going to go past, probably your instructor probably won't even go past 40 degrees of bank because you're going to catch it long before it ever gets that bad. So tumbling is very, very, very unlikely. Yay, we're to the heading indicator or directional gyro. If you'd rather call it DG the whole time, that's fine. So if you don't even want to write the word heading indicator down, that's okay with me. If you prefer directional gyro or DG, that's great. So it's also got a gyro. It's also got gimbals. And it's, very, it's, it's adding one, the dimension that attitude indicators don't give you. Attitude indicators give you pitch and roll, and directional gyro gives you sort of, it gives you yaw. It really tells you which way the, the nose of the airplane is pointed. So we could argue that it's telling you what heading you're on, which is, could you, can you turn the airplane with just the rudder pedals? Yeah. Could you try to keep the wings level and then just keep pushing on the rudder pedals and make the heading change? Yeah, you can. It's not very effective. So whereas if we were looking at an attitude indicator and we're looking at that front card, that shield from higher or lower, or we're banking left and right, in this case, it's as if we're rotating around it. 
So if there's a direct, if there's a gyro here, and we'll say we look down on it, and it's spinning clockwise, looking down on it, we gear that into a card, the face, and that gyro is spinning. All that mechanism is doing is saying we're not pointed there. We're pointed here in relation to that gyro. Or we're pointed here in relation to that gyro. And as we move around, that card or that face just twists based on what different heading we're looking at it. You know, here's this case and here's this gyro spinning. If we look at that face, all we're doing when we yaw the airplane or change headings is we're looking at the gyro from a different angle. All that connection between the gyro and that face is doing is effectively telling us where on that gyro are we looking and chopping it up into 360 degrees. Oh, a paper clip. Score. And so there's a nice picture. You don't have to draw the interior. There's a gyro, there's a card, and you notice there's a big shaft coming off the top with, right here, the big shaft with the big gear on top. So effectively, if we, if we wiggle around, well, I already covered it. I'm going to stop talking there. And there's a nice color picture effectively saying the same thing. I like this picture here because you can actually see the, uh, you can see these veins on the gyro. And if you had a nozzle over here, and air was getting sucked in, sucked from here and blown across those veins. Now we'll just say that goes to the outside, and we have another spot where the air. I guess it would be. Oh, never mind. I'm trying to describe the the vein, the, the 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 tube that goes in there where the vacuum gets sucked. But I'm doing a lousy job, so I'm going to stop. Directional gyro. Still, let's talk errors. Bearing friction and precession are the two biggest things that are going to cause error. So what's precession? Does anybody remember? That's where you have a big parade, and there's a band, and they play music, and somebody's carrying a flag, and they wear uniforms, and it's kind of like a parade. Precession is when I poke on that gyro, and it, it impacts it 90 degrees later and, and makes the gyro read differently. We can never get away from precession. So we're always going to have a little bit. And, of course, if that gyro has a little bit of friction in it, it's going to slow it down. Oh, wait, but it could also cause a little bit of precession on it. So even uh, I put it in here. Okay. Right here. According to Jeppesen textbook, you should be checking your directional gyro every, according to the Jeppesen textbook. Jeppesen textbook says every 15 minutes. You're going to get a really good feel for every airplane you fly and how often you ought to set that DG. In a good pre-approach checklist, that's one of those things you're going to do is you're going to set your directional gyro before the beginning of the approach so that its accuracy is really, really good for that last 10 or 15 minutes. It's not that you might not check it again during the approach, but you probably aren't going to have to reset it. Of course, tumbling, again, the, the likelihood of you pitching or yawing or banking the airplane to the point where it's tumbling under control, under, under all circumstances during your training it's not going to happen unless something's wrong with the gyro. Ta -da. So this would be at a minimum, no less than every 15 minutes. Me personally, I'm used to flying old airplanes, so I just generally I'm checking my gyros a lot sooner, a lot more often than that. be a fun question to ask Mr. Brannon and say, can we file real IFR in the PA-28s? I don't see any reason not to. If, you pa if it passes a, a, a pre-flight inspection and the uh, pedostatic mass gets hot and we've got a good altimeter and static system check done within the last 24 calendar months, 
When, when can we fly the airplane without an altimeter and static system test? When it's 25 months, when it expired last month. It's been 25 months since the last altimeter static system test. When, when? When is that legal to do every day of the week? You look in the blue sheet and you see the last pedo correction, the last altimeter static system check was done in July of 17. So that it was good until the last day of July of 19. But now it's August. Can we go fly that airplane today? Under what set of circumstances is it legal, moral, and ethical to fly the airplane? What? No, no, it's not broken. We don't have to deactivate it. Under VFR. The only time you need a valid altimeter slash static system inspection, which is good for 24 months, is when you're flying real IFR. Now, that would be a really good question on your check ride. It's, it's, it's a good VFR day. You're going to go on your check ride. You pull out the blue, you look at the blue sheet, and it says the last altimeter static system check was done, inspection was done in July of 2017. So that means it expired on the last day of July of 2019, 24 months later. I would look that, I would show that to my examiner, and I would say, if we're flying IFR today, we can't fly the airplane because this inspection has expired. I've looked at the weather, and we're going to be VFR all day long, and you're going to be looking out the window, and we're simulating IMC anyway. For training purposes and for checkride purposes, I say that we are legal. We are not violating any FARs today. Will you accept the airplane today, even though it's only legal for VFR? Maybe that's a question to ask your flight instructor. Or you're coming up on your check ride and you keep looking at the blue sheet and you tell the dispatcher, hey, this thing's expiring at the end of this month. Do you ever need to tell somebody that they need to, we need to get an altimeter static system check done? All right, we're going to talk about two different turn indicators. The old school turn indicator indicates yaw, and the turn coordinator, you know, it indicates yaw and a little bit of roll. So we're just going to cover the old school turn indicator a little tiny bit here in a second. So all these gyros work on rigidity in space. Turn coordinators are going to point needles at you because you're trying to uh, you're trying to move the gyro. You are trying to move that gyro. And it's going to say, wait, 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 I don't want to move, I don't want to move. And that's what that needle is going to tell you. Have you ever heard a gyro say that to you? Wait, 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 wait. Okay. So while we're on this slide here, I think you ought to draw an arrow to that and say turn and slip only. Let's see if I can draw it. Here we go. And yaw and roll. That's going to be the turn coordinator. The problem is there are turn and slip indicators out there. There's still a few, and it's still IFR legal. Mostly, we're going to be talking about the turn coordinator. So regardless of which kind of, whether it's a turn and slip or a turn coordinator, it, they're all going to tell you standard rate of turn, which, of course, we know what that is. It's doing a 360-degree turn in two minutes. 
Another way to describe that is three degrees of heading change per second. So here's some pilot math. We want to turn, make a 90 degree heading change. If we use a standard rate turn, how many seconds will it take to make this turn? 90 degrees divided by three is 30 seconds. You could also look at it and say, okay, 90 degrees is a fourth of 360. What's a fourth of two minutes? 30 seconds. The reason I bring this up is because if you're flying along and you think your comp and, and your directional gyro goes bad and you're flying straight and level in unaccelerated or decelerated flight, those compass corrections suck. Trying to figure out leading and lagging and all that junk. Well, if you're on a good known heading and you say, okay, I got to turn 15 degrees, 15 divided by three is five. I need to go into that turn for five seconds, look at my timer, count to 5,000, you know, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, roll out. Time turns are the only way to go if your directional gyro goes out. And when I say only, I don't mean only, but it's absolutely the best way to do it. So you're going to end up, before you get your instrument rating, practicing that the directional gyro has gone bad, and you're going to have to do timed Turn. So let's take that today in sim. Let's say you're flying into uh, Clovis VOR and your, your magnetic course you've got set is 260. So I'm going to turn from 260. I'm going to make a slight right turn to 277. That's 17 degrees. I'm going to round it to the nearest three. That's 18. 18 divided by three is six seconds. So when I get there, if my DG is not working right, I'm just going to turn for six seconds and roll out and wait for my compass to calm down again. And then, and then it's going to be off a degree or two. Okay, fine. And then I'm going to turn a little tiny bit. So you don't have to write these three, number, these, th these three lines here. You don't have to write these three down here. I'm not going to ask you these three lines here. But you need to get, understand that the faster your true airspeed, it's not ground speed, it's not indicated, it's true. The faster your true airspeed is, the sharper the bank angle, the steeper the bank angle you're going to need to make to get a standard rate turn. There's that formula. You know, I'm not going to ask you a question on the test. What's the formula? But if you take your true airspeed, 100 knots divided by 5, that's 20 and then add 5 to it, uh, correction, 100 divided by 10 is 10, 10 plus 5 more is 15, that's where I get this number right here. If you're doing 100 knots, that's why I was thinking it was 13 or 14 degrees, because I'm used to instrument training in an airplane that's doing 90 knots. So 90 divided by 10 is 9, 9 plus 5 is 14. So if you're seeing that it takes 18 degrees of bank, that means you subtract 5 from 18 is 13, that means you're probably doing 130 knots true airspeed. So the reason I'm bringing this up is not so you can calculate this, but what if you're flying a jet and you're doing 500 knots true? 500 knots divided by 10 is 50. 50 plus 5 is 55. How many people have been in a jet airliner where they did 55 degree bank turns? They don't. They got the autopilot on. Guess what? They go to 25 degree bank, degree bank and they stop. They don't go past 25 degrees. The flight director, which is just a name for a really trick computerized autopilot, it goes, if the autopilot's on, it goes to 25 degrees and it stops. So 25 is a little under 55, so that means it's going to turn at about half the degrees per second as it would otherwise. So jets are doing about a four-minute turn. And nobody's going to ask you about any of this until you get a job as a co-pilot at an airline or at corporate flying. So you don't have to do, know this that's why I said you don't have to write it down. But I think it's interesting because jets don't turn 55, unless you're in the U.S. military, and then you're going, oh, sorry. The airplane I was on, we went to 25 degrees of bank, and we had big old honking turns. Can I say big old honking? All right. All right. So the old turn and slip indicator, you're probably not going to, you're not going to see them in training, but you might get asked them in on the check ride, and really the only difference between the old turn and slip indicator versus a turn coordinator is how the gyro is mounted and therefore 
what data it gives you. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the old turn and slip indicator first. So here's a picture of an old turn and slip indicator. It's got what people refer to as the dog houses. It certainly has an inclinometer. That's still also in the turn coordinators you're flying. But the turn coordinator you're flying, it actually says turn coordinator, and it's got airplane wings on it. This doesn't have airplane wings. If you turned this, if you started a rate of turn, and you got the needle to line up with one of the two dog houses, that's a standard rate two-minute turn. Okay. So it's really easy to fly. What you're used to, though, and what you're going to be flying is a turn coordinator. And you line up the wing with that line, and that's a standard rate turn. So let's say, just for fun, you're doing 250 knots, true airspeed. You divide that by 10, that's 25. You add 5 to it, that's 30 degrees of bank. So if you're in a turboprop and you're doing 250 knots true, if you want to still do a two-minute turn, you're going, to, you're going to have to go to a 30 degree bank turn. But if you've got a trick autopilot, flight director is probably going to just go to 25 degrees, and that's going to be close enough. So really, there's only really two instances. The, the things you've got to understand, the old turn and slip, it only measures change of heading only. If you'd rather do change of heading than yaw, but yaw works great, it only measures how much the airplane's nose is moving. It does not take into account whatsoever if you're banked, not to the, any degree whatsoever. And somebody figured out, well, that's not quite so good. What if you're flying along and the attitude indicator fails and you slightly cross-control your turn? You might go into a bank but you're not do, using the right amount of rudder, and you're not turning, but the airplane's going to turn here in a minute. If you're flying along with no attitude indicator, now what, why, why would you not have an attitude indicator? What? what? What kind of an instrument failure? An attitude indicator instrument failure. So here's Begs. I'm going to tell you that if you look statistically in small airplanes, do attitude indicators fail more often or do vacuum pumps fail more often? The vacuum pumps fail a lot more often. So if you have an attitude indicator problem, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the suction. And if I have low suction, now what does that tell me about the directional gyro? It's not going to work so well either. Now I'm going to say I hope my alternator keeps working because my best gyro now is my turn coordinator. So if you don't have a good attitude indicator, it'd be kind of nice to know if you're going to start turning. So turn coordinators, I'll get to it here in a second, it senses the yaw and it senses your rate of roll when you're entering a turn. So this is the operational difference that's in a turn coordinator that you're flying is that it tells you that the heading changes, but the gyro in there is canted. It's offset a little bit. And it's if you start banking the airplane, the turn coordinator, as you're entering that turn, the turn coordinator airplane is going to move. So this is very, very helpful if your attitude indicator is dead because it's going to be a lot harder to know what bank you're in, especially when your attitude indicator starts failing your DG starts failing, because that would have been a good place to look to see if you were turning, right? Is your directional gyro? So that kind of sucks when you lose your attitude indicator and your directional gyro. So nobody builds turn and slip indicators anymore. There's still a few out there. But what's more important is you've got this canted gyro, and not only does it sense that you're yawing and changing heading, when you start entering a turn, even though all you've done so far is bank, that airplane's going to start to move and tell you, aha, the airplane is starting to enter a bank. And that's a whole lot better than if it doesn't tell you that at all. So now if the attitude indicator, and what we're going to end up doing is we're going to go in there and we're going to fail the attitude indicator. We're going to, actually we'll fail the vacuum pump. 
in the simulator. Because you can't, the best you can do in the airplane is you take one of those little pieces of plastic that's got the suction cups that you put on a bathtub to stick your soap. Supposedly it sticks to the bathroom, the tub, and it sticks to the soap. And you stick those up on the attitude indicator and go, ha ha, your attitude indicator died. Or you stick it up on the attitude indicator and the directional gyro. This is the instructor says, ha ha, you have low suction. Surely they don't say, ha ha. And of course, we all know that it has an inclinometer, and we're not going to review the use of an inclinometer. So I think I'm going to go back to the picture. Did I, oh, wait, I think it was at the end of this picture. Oh, where was it? I had a picture. That's the picture. It is a lousy picture. All right. Anybody have any questions about turn coordinators? Oh, I've, I've, I forgot to tell you, uh, just in case, uh, it's better that it comes from me instead of anybody else. Uh, Mr. Mike Rashad uh, is not being rehired as an adjunct flight instructor for this semester. We're going to have five flight instructors. Emilio Rosales, Paolo DeCenzi, and Marty Brannon. Yes, the name. There is a connection. He, I think his check ride is, was Sunday. Uh, there's Patrick, last name starts with an N, Nav, I think it's N-A-V-A-B-I, Navabi. Uh, he did his private and his instrument at JB, and then he went to, uh, I think he went to ATP, and he got his commercial, single commercial multi, his CFI and his CFII. And then uh, you might have seen Colton Morgan has been flight instructing at JB Aeronautics for three to six months. So of those instructors, you, you will not be assigned to, um, let's see, well, let me try it the other way. Who, who's got a double I or going to have it right by the time you need it? Emilio, Paolo, and Patrick. Those are the, the, those are the instructors out of those five that you're going to get assigned to. Uh, and I'm going to work on, I'm getting a meeting together next week. I'm taking all your availability sheets, and I'm going to sit down with all those instructors, and we're going to, those three instructors, and we're going to make it fit. All right, we already talked about that uh, you need, a, and that's a very, very approximate number. There's too many variables. What if you run the engine at 1,300 instead of 800, right? The suction's going to be higher. So it, that, that's a very, very approximate number. So let's, let's now let's look at uh, the things you're going to be looking at before takeoff to try to tell you that these three gyros are working correctly. If on electrically powered gyros, it's very common to have an off flag. And there's more different methods of off flags than this. So every instrument is different. This is an electric gyro. In small airplanes, I've never seen an off flag on an attitude indicator or a directional, excuse me, a directional gyro. So you're not going to see, in the airplanes you're flying, you're not going to see an off flag in the attitude indicator or the directional gyro. You're going to be looking for that low suction light, warning light, or you're going to be looking for the suction gauge. So here is a turn coordinator, and it has a red flag. If it's dead, that is if no electricity is going to it. So this is what I would suggest you do to see if you have a flag on your turn coordinator, because there are turn coordinators out there that don't have a red flag to tell you effectively it's getting electricity or it's not. So take a look. But next time you go out, before you turn on the master switch, look at the turn coordinator, see if you see a red flag. And of course, again, I've not seen a directional gyro in a small airplane with a flag. All right. So. Uh, is it is it extra noisy? Is it extra noisy? So this is very difficult to say, oh, it's making so much noise that I can't go fly. So let's talk about that for a second. If it's, if it's day VFR or night VFR, do you have to have any of those three gyros? Gyros are not in A, tomato flames, or flaps. 
Now, one could argue if you're going to go flying at night, especially if you're going to go flying over the west side of the, of, of the San Joaquin Valley or over the mountains or, or near the ocean, that you're going to lose a lot of outside attitude indications from looking outside the window, right? Or if you're flying in low visibility. So you might decide, even if a gyro isn't working, and you don't, even though you don't need it, you may decide you don't want to go anyway. The hard part is saying, ah, that is so noisy that I think it's going to fail in flight. So that's a very difficult decision to make. Okay, the attitude indicator should show less than a five degree bank turn when you're taxiing, and that's while it's rank cranking up. So if you've had a minute or two or three on the ground at the parking ramp, even though you're running the engine at 800 or 1,000 RPM, there is some suction. It is pulling air through the attitude indicator. If you start taxiing and it's more than, shows more than, it should show no, nothing, right? In theory, you would say, oh, the airplane's not banking when I'm making pedal turns on the ground. But if it's exceeding five degrees of bank, then I'm going to look really, really close at it. And I am, after I do my engine run up, I'm going to do a couple, I'm going to do a left turn and a right turn. And that thing better be doing less than five degrees at that time, or the attitude indicator is unairworthy. I get the fact that it's hard to know how fast it's spinning and whether I ought to be working during that first turn or two during taxi. But if I've gone out and I've ran the engine at 1,700 or 1,800 or 2,000 RPMs for 30 seconds or a minute, and I've done my engine checks, and then I pull it back to 800 or 1,000, and I do a left turn, even just a left or a right turn as I'm moving forward, if that thing goes past 5 degrees, it's not airworthy. Obviously, the D directional gyro staying aligned during turns, there's not a published number. And that 5 degrees that right there, that's not like a hard number. It's not like the FAA publishes an advisory circular and says, oh, if it's 5.1 degrees of, of roll, uh, it's unairworthy. And if it's 4.9, it's airworthy. It's not like that. The directional gyro, it's a little bit harder because, you, you, I mean, you can tell if, it, if, if the airplane's not, if the airplane's pretty close to zero degrees of bank. But it's hard to know exactly what heading you're on at any given moment. So you would actually have to stay on a heading going down a runway. And uh, is that heading on that, those long taxiways, is it 110? Is it 290? It's not exactly zero. If you look on an airport uh, diagram, it'll actually tell you what the actual magnetic heading of the runway is, which would be the exact magnetic heading of the taxiway. Like, for instance, of course, you'll have this in your iPad. Two nine or two point three? Oh, it said it on AirNav. Okay, right there it says, "I'm old school, man. I'm just used to looking at airport diagrams." So two ninety two point three. So two nine or two, and one one two. Turn coordinator ought to show that you're turning in the correct direction. How about the inclinometer? What does that little black ball do? Should it, while you're turning, should it be pointed straight down? It should be flung to the outside of the turn. Yeah, if you're turning to the right, it should be flung to the left. So you're going to, you can also check your inclinometer, of course. What I'm worried about right now is the gyros. So your turn coordinator ought to show that you're turning. 
And of course, I'm also going to be looking for a low voltage warning light. Obviously, we're going to do this anyway. But hey, low voltage is going to impact my turn coordinator. I'm also going to look at my alternator amps. If the alternator can't put out enough amps, then my turn coordinator is not going to work. I know this is pretty simple because you're already doing it. And if you're in an airplane that has a low suction warning light, I'm going to check it. And of course, you're going to look at the suction gauge. I think that's the last one I got. Yeah. So there'd be a good test question. Name the 25 pre-takeoff checks you're going to do just for your gyros. Well, that way you'll get about 10 of them wrong. 12 of them wrong, I don't know. Of course, it needs five minutes to spin up. That's not actually, you know, something you're checking. That's something you just got to, that's something you got to wait for. The great news is when you start flying the airplane, Every single time you go fly, you're going to be doing all these pre-takeoff checks. Uh, I, uh, I I bought Rod Machado. Is anybody who has not ever heard of Rod Machado? You never heard of Rod Machado? He's like the world's greatest uh, and famous flight instructor. I can't type. There it is. There he is. But I bought his audio book for his instrument book. He's got an instrument book. So I've been listening to the audio book. It's like, I don't even know how many hours it is. I've been listening to his audio book. And he, one of the things he starts out with, and I agree with him, is that when you become an instrument pilot, you become a much, much better uh, VFR pilot. So even when you're flying VFR, you're going to end up doing some instrument checks. Yay, at least we're finally to compasses. So you got a magnet. And in case you didn't know, the north seeking end of a magnet is the south pole, right? Opposites attract. So let's say you're looking in the, in, at a compass and you're aiming towards magnetic north. There's actually a magnet on that card, and the North Pole's facing you, and the South Pole is being attracted by the North Pole. So it's the North seeking end. But you're looking, in this case, you're looking at the opposite end. But hey, this is all review. Just for fun, does anybody know why there's an ex this expansion unit? There's no, there's no tubes in and no tubes out. Does anybody know why you got to have an expansion unit in there? If it's, there's fluid in here, what happens to the size or volume of fluid when it gets hot? It, it, it creases in which way? It creases up. It gets, it gets bigger. It tries to expand. Well, this thing is sealed off, so the case would have a lot of pressure on it. So this has got a little bit of air in it, so when the pressure in here gets higher, Instead of expanding and pushing the case out, it just squishes this down. Or when it gets cold and this contracts, this just gets bigger. That way the case itself is never overpressurized because it's supposed to be sealed. So you got a magnet floating and it has a low center of gravity. And of course, you're looking at the backside. If, if you're seeing, well, who cares about if you're looking at the backside? Don't write backside down. Don't write that down. So there, here are the basic compass errors. We're going to cover each one so you don't have to write them down. I'm not going to ask you a question. Name all four compass errors. I'm going to ask you questions about each one. So these are the four that we're going to cover. We probably will not get all of them done in the next two minutes. My personal favorite is magnetic deviation, but hey, that's just a personal issue I have. First, we're going to talk about magnetic variation. Magnetic variation, of course, is the difference between what's the direction the compass points and what is the, where is true north. And hopefully you remember from a year ago or your checkride oral exam preparation. That way up here is the true north pole and the magnetic north pole is over here. So if I'm sitting right here on this uh, 
isogonic line right here in Mexicali, then if I go to the magnetic North Pole and I point it to the true North Pole, the difference here would be 15 degrees. That's what this isogonic line of 15 degrees means, is that the true North Pole is where the axis of the Earth is in the middle of the Arctic. You know, there's snow and stuff up there. The magnetic North Pole is actually on an island in northern Canada. If I'm on the zero degree line, no, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that example right there, but everybody ought to, so magnetic variation, we pay a lot of attention to that when we're doing cross-country planning, yes? Okay. Magnetic deviation, on the other hand, is when there is some thing that's magnetized that's making my compass read wrong. And there's effectively two kinds of local magnetic fields. The ones inside the airplane, including the radios, because when the radios are running, there's electricity running through them. And whenever you have electrons going through a wire, it generates magnetic lines of flux. So that compass card is to only taking into account what's on board the airplane. Anything on board the airplane, like the steel in the landing gear or the steel in the engine mount and the radios. Some of these will even usually say radio. Here it says, see radio on, radio off. Nobody ever flies with the radio off. In my airplane, I don't even have that line because I never fly with the radio off. So that only takes into account what's in the airplane. You could, there are places on the planet, including the United States, you can fly over and there's enough weird magnetism going on in the ground that it can impact the airplane. But that's very rare and we're not going to worry about it. So we're just going to use the compass correction card to say if I want to go in that heading, here's what I have to do on the compass. And that is enough for one day.